Okay, Jingyan, please. Yeah, so the paper I will present today is called uh, Representer Point Selection by Local Jacobian Expansion for Post Hoc Classified Explanation of Deep Neural Network and the Ensemble Models. And it's a paper right. for New York. It's a very long title, right? So could you pick up a few keywords of this, uh, uh, this, this sentence? Uh, Representer Point Selection meaning uh, so I, you can uh, wait, you can see the problem basically when you do the do a test you pick up some representer training data that contribute positively or negatively and the local jacobian expansion is the mass uh, formula they use when they deriving the kernel function and post hoc meaning you do the analysis after you train the data and deep neural network is the uh, network model and ensemble models is one, uh, they tried basically on three data set, and one of the data set is based on XG boost, so they call them ensemble mode. So, which means that these, these techniques is independent on the model type. It can either be a deep learning model or some decision tree, right? Yes, mm -hmm. as long as uh, there are pre requirements feel, uh, fulfilled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, this paper published last the New Europe's last year. All right, so and also what I take away just by looking at this title is that the explanations might be using sample to explain sample, right? Mm. Right. Okay, so let's keep going on. So as far as as far here, for, for here, any questions for for our discussion? Okay, if there's no question, let's keep 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 moving on. Uh, so this is uh, also information. Uh, any question? They are from University of Toronto. I know Toronto is growing AI. Um, yeah, I. Okay. I have no questions, but it's better for us to remember the group name. Maybe in the future, in the conference, we may meet those people. Um, especially when the COVID time passed. And now in China, there's still COVID situations, but in the world, almost, I think in Europe, the American has, America has opened. Okay. Okay. Mm. Uh, then we first have our problem definition. So for explanation system, it's saying that giving a prediction, we want to know which training data contributes most to the prediction. So for example, uh, this rhino and positive samples are those samples that, that the similarity to that training po point is excitatory. And for negative samples, it means that similarity to that training point is inhibitory. So it's uh, not as obvious like uh, these are not similar, these are similar, but just saying the similarity to them are uh, having negative effect. Uh, let me let me rephrase your point. So, mm -hmm. um, if we so here, um, there is um, it is a from the from the left the most left images. It is a correct prediction, right? Yes. The rhinoceros is predicted rhinoceros, mm -hmm. and to in in order to explain why the prediction is correct, it mm -hmm. is left three training samples on uh, three. Uh, accelerate maybe help for training examples and inhibitory tra training examples, three inhibitory training examples, maybe the help for training examples to explain on uh, why these images have been pretty correctly. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this data sample helps the model analyze this is the rhino. Mm -hmm. Um And for this training, for the training samples, right? And will you please uh, explain a little bit about the training negative examples? So it is, um, it is a, it is a misprediction. It's always the mistaken predictions, even for the training sample. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not. So which means that the more accurate model fitting those images, the more harmful the model going to make a wrong prediction on the test sample, right? 
Uh, I didn't get to your question. Okay, my question is uh, basically it's a yes or no questions. Oh. So for those three negative examples, which means that on uh, some more, the better job the model has done to fit those examples, to fit those samples, the more likely the model might make a wrong predictions on the test sample. Am I correct or not? Uh. Uh, not really. Uh, you um, can see yeah. the, the yeah, meaning so, of negative. Yeah, so you can see. So for all of those six training samples, right, the model predicts them correctly, mm. or the model fitting them well, right? Mm. And uh, the, th the the up three ones are positive ones, which means that the more the model fitting those samples, the more likely the model have a correct predictions. And for the lower three examples, which means that the better the model fitting those examples, the more likely the model may have incorrect predictions on the test samples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I is, is that a way to, to interpret it? I think yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, to get into the uh, method, the paper presents uh, RPS LJE. And that's based on the previous method. So I want to give more background information about this previous method. Uh, so it's a paper in 2018 and it's based on representer theorem. And it's work for any kind of deep neural network. So our input space is RD, like D is the image uh, pixel size. And our output space could be RC and C is the number of classes and we have n training data. Uh, so for this uh, deep neural network, in the last layer, we put y as a prediction and it's a sigmoid function of the phi. And uh, this is RC, right? And here we, we let the phi equals to uh, theta one fi. So theta one is the matrix of uh, size uh, C times F and theta is basically like the parameters of the last layer. And F is the dimension of the features where feature F is uh, theta two Xi, uh, uh, phi two Xi theta two. And it's the uh, last intermediate layer feature for input X. Basically it considers all of them as a feature for the input data and uh, see that too is all other parameters in the model, except the last one. And here, here the theta is just a union of theta one and theta two. Maybe I write, uh, sorry, I'm writing a sentence and I would like to raise a question to the student. Um, so I write some questions here. Then I write um, the, the square is here. So maybe I ask you fine. You find it still there? You know, can can you can you mention whether the red the red rectangle represents represents theta one or theta two? Uh, pardon, please. I draw two rectangles on the. Yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. Do you see that? So my question is, which one is theta one and which one is theta two? Uh, uh theta one is the red one. Theta two are the wait wait, uh. Uh, theta two is uh, uh, for all the parameters, so it's the uh, pink one, and the theta one I think is the uh, red one. Is this right? Maybe Jingyan can give the answer. All right. Okay. And so, what region of theta? If uh. What is the region of oh, theta? We have theta, theta one, and theta two, right? So what is theta? Where is the theta? Theta is just the parameters. Yeah, so where, where are the regions? Where, which region is there? Uh, I mean the region, so basically, uh, you, you get, my point, get my point? No, what's the meaning uh, of? Region. So we have we have we have an area of theta one and here have an area of theta two, right? Yes. And where is the, and what is the region of theta? Uh, 
think it's just a symbol. And uh, in one scenario, it stands for theta one. In another scenario, it stands for theta two. Uh, Jingyan, do you agree with your friend's uh, argument? Uh, theta is the union of theta one and two. So that's the whole, all parameters in the model. Okay. okay. You find get? Yeah, okay. Okay. So let's keep, I think everyone understands this. Let's keep moving on. So uh, they call the last layer prediction network and the previous layers as a feature model. So we, I just uh, uh, highlight them here. And uh, previously is an introduction. And for this model, we have an empirical risk the average of the loss, sum of the loss. And we have some, the, the most uh, standard form of the, of the optimization is that your theta star is the arc minimum of empirical risk plus uh, regularization term. And uh, by represent, represent our theorem, we hope the pre-activation prediction can have the form that your uh, phi here is uh, linear combination of some kernel functions uh, with some coefficient. So this is a target form we want. And in this target form, you can see for every k is only related to your test data and uh, one of your sample, uh, one of your training data and your phi prediction is a linear combination of them. Uh, then uh, this alpha k is the contribution of the training data xi on the testing prediction y t. Any question? Um, so is there any question for for this slide? You have no question. So I encourage Xiangling, do you have questions on this slide? Um no. And then Ruofan, how about how about Ruofan? No. <clears throat> okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, sorry, I missed the one thing. What is the G C how I mean in the mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, regularization term, it can be L1 norm or L2 norm. Okay, I see, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my question follows Dr. Xiaoyan's questions. <clears throat> Usually, we, if we want to optimize equal justified optimizations, why we need to include this normalization? We usually only have the, the, the previous one, right? The first item. We usually don't have the second item. What, this, what does this item play? What role does this item play? Uh, firstly, uh, regularization is really important in machine learning because it prevents overfitting. So when you have a punishment to the parameters, you you are tend to like make them small and then like avoid overfitting. And also this is what they present in this method. So they just use this. And later you will see it. So yeah, so maybe my, my uh, more, uh, more, Correct form of my question is that why do we have to use this formula? Because we have many, <clears throat> it is user's choice to using regularizations or not, right? Mm. So the user may or may not use the regularization technique. Uh, so the question is why they have to pre present the formula in such a way. I think another reason is that in the mm. traditional representer theorem, they have the normalization term. And it helps you to build a linear transformation. It's kind of proof, right? Their theorem is kind of proof. Yeah, I hide it because I don't want to go through proof. But normally in the uh, traditional theorem, they use it and then they, they right. it helps. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so for this method, they are saying the old representative theorem have only been developed for non-parametric predictors. And the old theorem requires global optimum, but global optimum in deep neural network is difficult. So uh, they propose this method and I will go through their theorem. Basically they train, they further, they already have a trained model and then they further fine tune. And then this is a fine tuned parameter and they let it to be the kernel function. So uh, for the theorem, they have y equals to uh, phi. 
and the phi is a linear combination of f, and f is a, a phi two. And they suppose uh, this that star is a stationary point of, of optimization uh, problem, and they use the uh, layer two norm. Uh, then uh, they claim that we can further decompose uh, this uh, phi as a linear combination of k, and the k is in this format, and the r phi is in uh, is in this format. Uh, I can go. Uh, there is a proof in the next page. Do we want to go there? I personally vote for yes. And how about the <laughs> other students? And Dr. Shaiyan, what's your do you want to go through the proof? Maybe have a try. Okay, so the roof, so I think roof is very good at math, right? So maybe we can go through that. Okay, so let's start the proof interpretation. Uh, so I will start. Okay, please. Uh, so at the optimum, uh, this is argmin and it's a stationary point. So the derivative of this is a zero. So you can see the derivative of loss over theta one uh, plus, that's the derivative derivative of layer two norm is zero. So you move the terms and uh, move the theta one star to one side. Then the second side is this. The next, uh, the next side is this, this term. And, uh, it's a constant times the sum of uh, derivative. And we let R phi equals to, we, we keep the constant. And here by the chain rule, uh, the deri derivative of, of L over theta one is derivative of uh, phi times the derivative of phi over theta one. And because phi is a linear combination, so the second part of the chain rule is just the F1. So we extract F1 transpose here out and put other things as R phi i. So is that fine? So so it's done, right? So just three steps. Mm. Um, is there a question for this proof? It's kind of um, interesting, right? Any question here? Any question here? So I think we do have some time to go through the proof here. If you have any question, uh, Rufan, do you have any question? No. Okay, let's keep going on. Okay, then the and, last... And here, my takeaway that based on proof, it seems that it is very important to have this uh, norm. norm, right? So if it, there's no norm, we cannot have the theta one star, and we do not have such a beautiful or concise form to provide this linear combination. So my follow-up question is that, what if our optimization function or our loss function does not have this norm? So in this case, then that means that these linear combinations cannot be called anymore. Uh, that anyway, you fine tune it with, with L2 norm after you got the model. And for some of the models, you- Yeah, so the question, the problem is that if we want to use this so-called representative point selection, which means that we have to enforce a regularization, maybe it have to be the L2 normalization, regularization, right? To, to, to have these linear combinations. But, it, but if I'm the user of the models, uh, maybe introducing regularizations will degenerate the performance model. And then what should I do? So this is, this is a price for me to pay for the explanation, but sometimes um, I don't want to pay the price. And uh, what should I do next? Uh, this is the background. So some of the mm -hmm. questions will be addressed in the, today's paper. Okay, sure. Great. Uh, okay. And then for the last layer, the phi is linear combination of uh, theta mm -hmm. i star times ft. So we finally get the kernel uh, formula for our case. And alpha i can be seen as the resistance for training example feature fi towards minimizing the norm of the weight matrix. So the larger is you are preventing the norm to be small and the smaller is you are likely to fit the data. Is that? Okay. So uh, there are two problems with the background method. So there is a discrete 
disagreement between the original trained network and the RPSL2 regularized network modification. So after you fine tune, uh, your explanation is based on the new Theta star and it's not the original model. And when you have different L2 norm parameters, the explanation is different. That's a problem one. Okay. And uh, for problem two, uh, they find that this method often gives a static ranking of training data for the test points in the same class. It's independent of the test point being classified. So uh, we, from the previous part, we have this uh, theta one star and this dominant term ignores more difference introduced by the test examples. So they are showing that for all cars, they are having the same explanation. Uh, sorry, I didn't get this point well. So on uh, here is a year of the static ranking of the training data. Uh, and, and, and can you can you elaborate a little bit more about this static part? Uh, because your uh, mm. explanation is chosen based on the alpha i, and alpha i is uh, is is independent of the test data. So no matter seems like no matter what's your test data, you are always having the same alpha i for the same i. Um. So let me think about it. So this theta one star is um is a model parameter, right? And so this model, <clears throat> this model parameters um so can go back to the previous slide. Sorry, I we kind of forget about the some details, right? So here we are saying that on um, the model parameters or the optimal model parameters is a linear combination of this this f right mm. um so, oh i mean this is because this is like a rank mm -hmm. of alpha then yeah yeah so here so if i understand the correct way so given a test point it is supposed to be it's pretty if i understand correct way, given the the prediction of the test point can be constructed by a linear combination of these te the training samples. Yes. Am I correct? So how then in this case, how this set of one star means? I get um, a little confused here. Sita one is a mm. parameter here. And when you do prediction. And sita one is basically always associated with an XI, right? Or XT. Uh, no, right? you're. Mm. Uh, Theta one is theta one is actually so if we want to calculate the theta one, so theta one is basically the parameter. So what we're talking about is the output of theta one. Uh -huh. uh, you, you get you got that point. So you can see this formula. Um which formula? The the third line. Yeah. Here, here, right? So this one. Oh. So this theta one must be this, this theta one star must be associated with an xt. You see here the theta one is not related to the oh, xt. Oh, I see, I see, XT I see. is so, in the ft. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we got it right. So, so then, um, so maybe move next one. So theta one is independent with that training points, right? Yes. And it so the formula and the formula here is uh, so which means that the theta one. Well, the theta one is actually a combination of all linear training. It's, it's a linear combination of so all the training point, all the training points. Yes. Um. Okay, I see. I see, so this alpha. Okay. Okay. So let's keep, keep move on. So in this case, which means that, given a theta one. I'll say so. This point is that given, given, so assume we have a theta, theta one stars, an arbitrary, um, so the testing samples were always provide the same explanations, okay? Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, here is their solution. So, uh, again, the input space is RD and output space is okay. 
and they have a classy file. You, you are talking about, they put a dagger sign here to indicate this is the original data. And you also assume linear, linear combination in the last layer. Uh, last layer, they use different sign anyway. So uh, they consider model M is well trained and the parameter, the theta last, uh, previously we call it theta one, but here we call it theta last, is close to the settle point. So it's meaning that the derivative of loss over theta last is almost zero. And they assume that uh, loss L is uh, twi twice differentiable and strictly convex with respect to the last linear layer parameter theta L. And they form a convex quadratic approximation of the loss by adding a damper term. So, uh, so this is a loss, right? So they expand by first order Taylor expansion. So this is the first order derivative where the theta L equals to theta L's, L star. And then the theta L dagger is the original data point. So you, the, the, the second, the, the first order expansion is the, this term plus this uh, second order derivative times the difference between your theta dagger and theta star. We, we will know the theta star is what we were trained. Like it's kind of also kind of fine tuned. Yeah. Is it a way to approximation there? Yes. Okay, let's keep move on. Oh, by the way, is there any questions for this equation? Uh, Yifan, do you have a question? No. Okay, so maybe I raise a question for you. So here, um, maybe my question is why do we bother to make such an approximation? Yifan, can you answer this question? Maybe it will be more accurate to add another term, you know, the first order Taylor expansion. Mm. And Jimmy, what's your response? Uh, because in this term, we don't really have theta dagger. So we need this term to like so get close to the relationship theta. between the theta dagger and theta star. Yeah. Mm. So, okay, maybe, maybe. And so giving the other zero here, so we're just doing the calculations, but I think this kind of, a, and, and my question here is that computational expensive here because we need the S matrix, right? Yes, because of the Haitian, it should be expensive, mm -hmm. but okay. they never mentioned it. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, then the theta dagger is linear combination of function of each data point in this way. So uh, this is the expansion formula, we, we call this a uh, uh, derivative of loss and we call this part the patient. Then we shift the terms just like previously. And then your see the dagger is uh, in this formula and this is a damper term. And uh, this equation shows the model parameter, the real model parameter dagger could be reconstructed through a one-step gradient descent from a nearby parameter theta star with a dy dynamic learning uh, rate. Uh, it, it's Which has, provides an empirical guidance for us to derive theta dagger, right? Yes. Mm. So, uh, so you get the model, then you really need to kind of like fine tune to get a theta star and theta star has to close to the theta dagger. So it, it's uh, computed from a one step stochastic gradient ascent, ascent from the training model using any optimizer. So the loss of your star is, should be uh, larger, but slightly larger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Anyway, we will use it later. <laughs> so then the original model, you can see uh, it, it now, the, in the original model, the last layer is linear combination of, uh, uh, this is actually phi, <laughs> F, Fxi. So in the last layer is now see that dagger times the, uh, here they call phi and it's now, we call this term alpha i, and this is the kernel that 
That yeah, is so this is a very interesting point. So which means that even without that regular regular like regular normalization, like the regularization terms, we can still the the the, the form of linear combinations still can be hold. Right? Yeah, by mm -hmm. the but by the Tyler approximation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh when the training data xi is close to the test point xt uh, in the representation space with a large positive alpha, then the prediction score for class k increased. And this first term contains inverse second order Hessian, uh, which estimates a correlation among parameter uh, parameter entries in CETA, this uh, dagger. So they claim that it uh, mitigates problem too. So it won't overweighting just some training data, but you will consider the whole Haitian and it will be more diverse based on your training. And explanation is now faithful with respect to the original model dagger instead of the uh, layer two. Layer two regularized the model. Yeah, I have a question here. So. This is a very interesting phenomenon saying that um, the the prediction of the the prediction of the the final prediction of testing samples can somehow still be, even if we do not have the regularization terms, we still can have a way to prove that it can be a linear combination of these testing, some, some, sorry, some training examples or, or the representation of training examples. So the question is that this term alpha i and how this alpha i relates to the Euclidean distance between these samples. Uh, do you get my point? Uh, I'm not too sure about that. So, so yeah, so when given the for, given the formula, right, I still try very hard to imagine it in my space with a, with some with a ratio eight. Oh. So here, suppose we have a training data xt, right? So here, the this basically is a representation form of xt, right? So we just use xt for the explanation. Suppose we have this one, and this formula means that it can be the presentation basically can be a set of on um, x1, x2, x3, maybe x4. Suppose we have five <clears throat> five most relevant training examples. It basically can be regarded as a linear combination of these training examples, right? Mm. And but here and each link here corresponding each alpha i. Am I right? Mm, I don't really think so. Okay, you don't, don't think so. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about this link is um, somehow kind of distance. But anyway, we can select that maybe the top five most impactful and relevant training samples and their representations and the linear combination of their representations can be used to represent xt. Is this understanding or interpretation correct? Uh, uh, I don't think so. Uh, mm. Here, uh, imagine like we have uh, mm. higher, uh, how should I say? Uh, here, here the phi is kind of like mapping the xi from the lower dimension to a some very high dimension, right? So this k is a kernel product of them. So the higher of them, Maybe it's like you are having more uh, units in this k direction. So you, it's like in a higher order when you have basic vectors like this k, you you are having larger larger uh, parameters in this uh, basis vector direction. So it's mm -hmm. not like this. So oh, here you can see. So this phi, this phi t corresponding to this phi t, right? Uh -huh. Right. So they're exactly the same. So the difference is the previous the previous item, this one. <clears throat> but if I look at this inverse one, and also maybe we can somehow change the space because this is phi xt and mm. this is phi xi, right? Mm. And each xi is a training point, the xt is a testing point. Mm. So which means somehow there's a way to, anyway, so there's suppose there's n items in these formulas. But some mm -hmm. items were have very little impact. So maybe you can just like using some four similar form of Tyler can throw them away. But we can only keep the most important and relevant XI. 
Uh, I think you should consider this two together because anyway, they are a kernel method. So this K is like, so you can you should consider this two as one single vector in a higher dimension and the larger your R5 is. So okay, the, so the point is that it's not a linear combination. It's so, 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 so some combination else, right? Yeah. Linear combination of kernel. Yeah, yeah, kernel. To measure the similarity between your training and testing. But alpha i is measuring the contribution of this training to the model parameter. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. So, mm, mm, so if you mm. want to draw a link to the Euclidean distance, maybe you can see the kernel term as some kind of similarity measurement. And this kernel is, uh, so this kernel is basically a scalar, right? Yeah. Mm. Mm. And for each turn of this sum, um, it will be independent with, with each other regarding the the testing sample. Mm. So we still. So, so if I want to write something down here, so still a sigma i equals one to n. So we can have a big F of xi uh, and sigma. So it's a big F of xi to the, is it possible we can write something like that? We can use the term, we can use an F to, to combine this one. Mm. You still need to put xt inside, right? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. But this t is just uh, the way here, right? It doesn't change, oh. change much. Huh. So we can. So here we just need to um, put the whole alpha i with. Uh, of course, we can see this kernel as a as a way to. Mm. Mm. So it is not a. So it's not a. We don't have a direct link between the distance. So basically, my mm. my very the, the questions very beginning in my mind is that um, usually we have uh, nearest neighbors, right? So given x t here, and we find a few of these na the training neighbors a, a, x one x two x three, and somehow they already have Euclidean distance. We can also think these these training samples kind of relevant to influence the prediction of this x t. I'm right. Yeah. So I'm trying to build the uh, link between them, but I think the link is not, not that straightforward. If alpha i is all mm -hmm. equal to one and my kernel is uh, some kind of cosine distance, then it's something mm -hmm. like what you mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's vector product, so it's the cosine similarity between phi mm -hmm. xi and phi x t. Mm. It cannot be one, right? So the point is, suppose so the, the matrix is identity matrix, and this kernel function is just a scalar. It's not possible, right? So here, here, here the presentation is on uh, this. This presentation present uh, is a vector in R C, right? Mm. Mm. And this basically is a scalar, right? And so, which means the alpha i is still a vector in R C. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, in their sample, they use sigmoid. So this is, I guess, c equals to one. It's a binary yeah. classification mm -hmm. problem. And uh, this phi, you can see it's based on the front part. We never fine tune the front part. So we can't control this part. The front part, what do you mean by the front part? Uh, is, is this film is a sigmoid, right? So this is a sigmoid. Uh, no, no. I mean, the, the fine, feature. Uh, yeah, the feature from oh. here. Mm. You never fine tune that. Okay. Mm. So, so, okay, is there any questions here? 
If there are no questions, let's move on. Okay. So the uh, alpha i is related to the model, original model only. So it uh, mitigates problem one. And th this is their example for the problem two, when you have a different test from the same class. Now it's also giving different explanation. And for the problem one, when searching the Sita star, the different learning rate is tried, but the explanation is consistent. And uh, the first experiment they tried is called data debugging task. So they fix uh, mislabeled training examples. So uh, they randomly flipped uh, 20 to 30 percent of the data points label. And uh, for the RPS method, they pick data points that have the largest uh, self-prediction contribution as the suspicious corrupted data points. And for the influence function, they use self-influence uh, as the score of ranking. So I prepared slides for the influence, but I want to skip them for so we can go through the examples. And their baseline is a random baseline. So they randomly pick data to check. And, and uh, uh, also uh, they partially correct data set. Like after 5% of checking, they will retrain the model and record the test accuracy for each task. So maybe I have a question for you of them. So how do you draw the links between the self-inference, the self-inference to, to, to detect the noise data? Influence function, you mean the mm. relation between influence function and this paper? Yeah, so here it's saying that the self-inference and the self-inference can calculate the score of each data and those data can be, and those, sorry, so these self-inference functions can calculate the score of each training points, and those scores can be used to select which points is negative, right? I Sorry, think it's very, very strange. Why do they use self-inference to calculate the influence with respect to itself? Yeah, so this is a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> that, that no, no if, it's not strange. Then the it's kernel will be equal to one, right? Then the kernel will always be equal to one because it's xi to xi. And uh, so the only part that functions will be the alpha i part. Okay, so Ruofan do not have the answer, but he raised another question. So Jingyan, can you help address this question? Uh, at least for them, even the k is one, so we only took as alpha one, but for other data, they pass a small, uh, small value for this product, meaning uh, their alpha is small and their k is small. So, I can only tell my interpretations. Maybe you can see whether it's correct or not. No. So here, given a sample, um, given a sample XI. Can you see that? Okay. Given given a sample XI, right? So suppose these are training samples, and we move its label. Um, we we change its labels. So the idea of inference function is that suppose we remove this XI, and we're going to predict XI. Right, suppose so the first XI was label one, and the second uh, XI is label two, right? So suppose we remove XI, we train a model M, and then we can predict XI of L, as L2, right? Suppose we suppose this XI is a noise data, which means that it will provide a negative impact on the original label. No, here yeah. we only use XI, we do not use the label. But when we test it, we will have a correct label, right? So we consider this. So if I have noise data, so if we train with noise data, and it must be the model must be able to predict the original data in an incorrect way, right? Hello? I don't think we look at the label. We do look at the label. So otherwise, how do you interpret the self-influence? Oh, I think I understand. For the self-influence, actually this mm. kernel part mm. will have no effect because for all the samples, if you measure the similarity to itself, but this is for then it will be the, 
yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, for the for the influence for for the influence function, you will also have something like this, right? Because the basic idea of influence function is first you trace the uh training point influence to the model's parameter and then times the model's parameter influence to the point you want to test. But here the point you want to test is just training. Yes, you're right. So the so, second part is the same as the first part. So we're only left with the first part. So, so we only have this alpha kind of thing, which only measures uh, whether the training point is influential to the current model's parameter compared to other points. Other points, I think the same points, it's called the self-influence, right? Well, uh, so here, this alpha, mm -hmm. remember it has the Heisen inverse, right? And the Heisen inverse actually is computed for over all the training points. So it can capture whether this point so is, the question is high relative so the, to the rest so the of the the question points. is that the Heisen function is calculated based on laws of testing laws. But based on all the mm -hmm. training laws, based on the summation of all the training laws <clears throat> gradient. Yes, you're right. But the, the loss function is the testing laws, right? Uh, here, here, because it's self-influence, so what is mentioned by the paper is mm -hmm. they, they compute training point to training point influence, not testing point to training point. Yes, you're right. So the, now that we just, since this is self-influence, we just replace the testing loss into the training loss of an individual sample. Yes. Right? So given arbitrary individual samples. So my question, my, problem, my, my, my interpretation is that if we want to calculate the, the so-called testing law, but anyway, there's a testing point there. So this label will be used as original label instead of the noise label. Oh, you get my point? Uh, we, we use the noise label because we test on the noisy model, right? We compute the influence on the noisy model, so. Okay, so if we're using the noise labels, how does mm. the self-influence Distinguish the noisy data and the clean data. It only distinguished by the influence. So here we want to see if we train on one, if we better fit one training samples, whether it can improve the testing loss, right? This is basically the idea of inference function. And if the, if if we're using the noise or the training loss. Mm -hmm. The label is definitely as what is used in the training model, when we train models. How do we distinguish the noise data and the clean data? They are supposed to be the same if the training is very, very sufficient and we have the model have been converged. And how do we make such a classification and discrimination? I mean, uh, I think if there are n data points and each n is kind of like linear combination of alpha i times k. No, we're right? talking about the inference function instead of the RPS. Uh, I think they are like they are going through each point and see mm. the point. Yeah, you're right. The so are. whatever the function it is, with inference functions, RPS, it always the, the, the idea is that given an arbitrary testing point, we want to see what training points will be most impactful, right? So mm. which means that we will assign a score to every training point so that we can calculate their qualities or impact, right? That is idea. Oh, but, but here they don't mm -hmm. trace testing to training, they trace training to training. That's why I feel very I think that this, I think that, yes, I think that the difference lies in whether the testing loss, mm -hmm. anyway, so we more, you can think about it, it's not training. It is exactly the same samples, but with a different label. And then the interpretation explanations can somehow used for the noise data. Suppose it is not the noise data. Um, so the, if, if it is noise data, and it must be helpful, right? But if it is noise data, it must be harmful. Not necessarily. Because, no, I think I will be helpful to train myself. You get my point? Suppose I'm the noise data, I must be harmful to train myself. So that is a, but anyway, that's a, that is interpretation for the paper to have a more specific explanations on these so-called self inference I don't agree. And how? And actually and, I and think what, and what whether it's helpful or harmful, 
Uh, I don't think there is a clear interpretation both in the original influence function paper also in this paper. I think, the original, I think it's hard to the interpret original, why it's harmful or helpful. Original influence is it experimenting or original influence functions talk about a self inference experiment? No, I, I don't remember that, right? Uh, let me have a check. Yeah, so, and, and Jing, and what is your point to uh, on this part? I think Rohan is kind of a uh, small expert in, mm -hmm. in this. Anyway, he will have a work on an inference function paper. But I think here, I think the inference function is supposed to be a good way for the experiment and evaluation. I actually don't uh, think the explanation that uh, noisy mm -hmm. points are harmful. I'm just thinking that Noise, your point is noise there yeah, as well, harmful. Yeah, because I think they mm -hmm. mentioned that for the those noise mm -hmm. points, when you predict it's it's its label itself is the most important to itself. So it's saying like those noisy points are like uh, outliers and away from others. Oh, sorry, sorry, <clears throat> sorry, would you please repeat and uh, what is the rationale <clears throat> of inference function to find the noise data? I was not that familiar with influence function. No, no, no. The influence function is you have the same exactly the, the same input output of RPS. Mm. Mm. They're exactly the same. So here, so we can secure an inference function. The input is a <clears throat> testing point, right? The yeah. output is a score. Sorry, the input is in training point and, and testing point. And oh. uh, the output is how inferential the training point affects the testing point. And all inference functions have this interface. And here, the question is, how are these inference functions going to help to discover the noise data? For the noisy data, yes. uh, even they exist in training sample, you take it out and then do a test. And during mm -hmm. the test, you find out that the data itself is the most important when you do the label. So it's yeah, so, can, so the idea way or the most uh, naive approach is that we, we get rid of one training points and yeah. we train the model to see whether the testing points have a, have a, have a have smaller loss, right? Uh -huh. So if it's smaller, is it helpful? If it gets larger, it would be, it would, it would be actually um, uh, harmful, right? It's supposed to be harmful. Mm. I checked and, the original mm. influence paper and they also use self-influence to do the mislabel data detection experiment. Okay, so how do they represent the so-called self-influence? Uh, I think it's when the absolute value of the influence is higher, that means this point is influential and mm. it might be it might be wrong. Yeah, so and here the question is what is the label used for this? Calculate this uh, well, calculate this input function. It's a noisy label. It is noisy label. Yeah. So yeah, that, yeah. if it is noisy label, how does it, how does it make sense? Uh yeah, because they try to draw a they cannot relation. explain. They cannot explain yeah. the causality. They, they so think only, that influential means possibly noisy, but I don't think so. All right, so is there any other, uh, uh, is there any other suggestions for these, these equations? I think my, my difference with Rolfine is just to whether these, the, the testing laws, and anyway, the training points using the testing laws is the original label or the noise label. So this noise only, label. Of, you, you, you insist on noise label. Yeah, noise but label. How, if it is noise label, how do we explain the difference? And, and why uh, it would be? Hmm. Because we are computing all these things on the noisy model. Mm. And this noisy model is assumed to be driven by those noisy data. Yes, you're right. So by right, it's the, we're getting the noise labels and the model we're predicting with the label noise prediction, right? So if you compute the and so, and, and so, point, so, so by right, every point would be helpful, right? So if uh, I'm going to predict I, myself, I must be the most helpful. If I put one testing point into the trainings, and then we'll train the model, which means that I must be the one most inferential to predict myself. Am I right? Yes. Right. And in this case, uh, sorry, and it's it been a puzzle to have confusion there. If I am use myself to train the model and, I'm, and then predict myself, I must be the most inferential one to predict myself. Is that I okay? Must be, I must be helpful. 
Yeah, it must be the helpful, most mm -hmm. helpful, right? So uh, in this case, every sample is equals. Every sample no, is equal. No, but the difference lies in the alpha i part. You, so, you understand, right? This i is almost alpha very close I. to the inference function, right? Anyway, this alpha i, okay, so if this alpha oh. i, the alpha i for myself must be the largest one. No, no, alpha i is the training point to model parameter. The kernel is i to itself. So the alpha i part should change for different i. The kernel okay, part okay. will not change. Okay, yeah. so so I think I we there's no so I, the overall inference function is alpha i times kernel xi I, and xi. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and xi and xi is almost to be one, right? It's yeah, yeah, to be yeah. One, right, yeah. and alpha i will be different. Yeah, but, I think, be... but my point is that even for alpha i, it will also it still be the largest if the inference function is supposed to be correct. You can think intuitively when training the model. When, I, when I was used for the trainings, why I can't be the one most in, impactful to myself? Why? Uh, you, why you can, you can. I think you can read the formula, mm. and then you will understand. No. Because you need to understand the formula of alpha i in both inference function and this table in order to, uh, in order to, yeah. Yeah, you can you can no, see here. I see, no, here, here. So whatever so this the formula will be different for different i, right? And this uh, thing so will also be dependent the, on the i. Maybe we we'll remove the notation so you can keep going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the file will be different, and this gradient will be different for different i. That's why for different x i, you will obtain different alpha i. Although your kernel will be the same because it's measuring xi to xi. I'm not talking about um, calculate how large this alpha i. I'm talking about how this alpha i is relative to the other alpha alpha, alpha i. Uh, because you can see this term, what this one is computing here is we, we are taking the gradient of theta star with respect to this data point, right? So if this data point is influential, this gradient will be large. Okay, so so my question is, so I have an argument or statement saying that when training myself to a model, I must be the most influential one to predicting myself. Is this statement correct or not? Yes. From your point of view? Yes. All right, so no, no, we, we are not we are not computing this summation. We are only use this alpha i times the kernel to measure each point's influence. Okay, okay. So so this this are uh, this formula is basically an estimation. So so we are not we are not using mm. using this summation. We are only using mm. this part. That's okay, why so so my it. my point is that okay, my point is that so this formula is basically an estimation, right? It is derived from the Taylor Taylor expansion. And we remove yes. all the rest one. Am I correct? Mm. So all these formulas must be conformed to the intuition, right? Yeah, it's conformed to the intuition. Um, so, sorry to interrupt, but what's the problem we are talking about now? The problem uh, is okay. the, pro uh. the problem is that how the inference function can be used to how the noise data will be used for evaluation the inference function. So basically, basically, RPS is a new variance of the inference function, right? Uh, so think about it. So the idea is that, so, uh, so we, we just have an interpretation maybe in the next slide. So Jingnan, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, mm. But Jingnan. <laughs> what? I mean, go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, yeah, so maybe I clean the data first here. So here the question is how this inference function, especially the self-inference, can be used to can be evaluated. So we have supposed to have an inference function. We do the self-inference, right? And how this random noise can help evaluate the effectiveness of the inference function. Okay, this is questions and uh, and one of the uh, my points is that uh, when we calculate inference functions, we're going to see 
whether suppose for the normal training data, the more the model fitting uh, the a sample and the more testing sample look um let me think about it. So more helpful, the testing samples might be more, most helpful to, to test it, right? But if it is noise data, the more we fit in the model, so the worse its original testing loss will be. And so that's supposed to be the way to evaluate the self inference function. Mm. Uh, you get my point? No. <laughs> okay, so the more right sense a question. Like oh, yeah. it's very clear. Why do you? Uh, because the noisy yeah. data would have, I think, it would have higher influence than other samples. Right? Yes. Oh. So it can detect the noisy data. Yeah. The so, noise will, will be higher influence to which testing point. Uh, so then this is the definition of self influence, right? We check the influence of Xi to Xi mm. and can be decomposed into two parts. The first part is sample I to sample I, and this part may be always equal to a constant. Therefore, this part is the influence of sample I to the model. So this will change for different I, right? Mm. I think for my understanding, if it's a normal training point, and of course, it self influence would be, uh, would be high. But if it's a noisy data, mm -hmm. then it, uh, it also need to reduce the influence from other samples. That would cause its noisy influence should be higher than normal samples, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you you compare the value of influence, then the noisy influence should be higher. Otherwise, it cannot be correctly classified as the, its noisy label. Hmm. When, when you try, when you are training, you already use the noisy data. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there would be some correct samples around the noisy data, and there would have some correct influence. So, so your noisy influence should be higher. Than that, in order the, for the, it, the higher the, your your higher is more helpful or more harmful. I mean, it your, doesn't your matter. Model, your model why doesn't matter? So that's a different. Oh, that means the because here we're looking at the absolute value, so we don't care whether helpful or harmful. No, the inference function is calculated positively. No, 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 no. Here we are ranking based on absolute value, so we don't care. I'm talking about the inference function instead. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Inference, but. The evaluation method is the same, right? So they so have are you are you sure for that? For the inference function, we're able to calculate uh, the, the negative and positive impact on the yeah, it's possible. Testing, it, it's possible, right? but when they do the experiment, they add the absolute sign, right? They add the absolute here. So they, they can the, add a, they can add so hmm. yeah. So I'm talking about inference function. So the question mm. is whether we can calculate a positive or negative impact. It is, we, we're able to do that, am I right? Yes. So the question is that if we using the noise label, I'm thinking about your point of making mm. the using the noise label mm. to test the inference. So mm. in this case, the question is, so something saying it to be higher, right? So, so my question is, suppose the noise data and the, the influence of the noise data to the cell with the noise label, regarding the noise label, mm. it is a more it is 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 more negative or more 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 um more positive. Oh, it depends on the, uh, it depends on the sign of this term, because for the second term is always positive, right? For the first term is not necessary to be positive. Um. Why it cannot be? The, why it cannot? Oh, because be? because mm. this part, if you remember, is derivative with respect to theta for x i. Yeah, but you can, do you still remember that? So given the inference function, oh. so which means that the comparison is the idea is that with or without training these samples, and how these samples can contribute uh, to predicting that sample. 
So given a simple I, right? Mm. And we want to produce simple J, right? And with and without this I, and how is this J can be predicted, oh. right? Uh, then and so in, in this case, mm. how this SI, suppose SI equals this J, and how removing SI will incur the negative impact to predict SI. Yes, but they do an estimation of this removal impact. It is not about estimation, it is about the evaluation. Yeah. And what is the measurement? So I think the measurement- Measurement is like the, this. No, I'm, I'm talking about the measure, evaluation measurement. The mm. evaluation measurement should be independent of any approach. There must be ground truth to evaluate the inference function. Oh. So, so my point is that given SI, it always contributes and help for to predicting SI, mm. right? No, 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 not necessarily. What I mentioned, the first term is not necessarily larger than zero. This is a formula I'm talking about, I talked about for twice. So this is an experiment, this is evaluation measurement, which should be independent for all the formulas and proofs. You get my point? So we're talking about no. how to design experiment to evaluate the effectiveness of the inference function. So this evaluation measurement should be independent for all the approach and provide kind of ground truths. So we're gonna see whether this approach that can provide a score conform to this evaluation measurement. Uh, you get my point? So in okay. this case, if we remove XI to predict SI, how this will provide the negative or you know, how is training SI will not help to predict SI? So this is uh, this is a fundamental question. Anyway, I, I don't right. know so why and, and, and this and this inference function is supposed to be an evaluation measurement, and this evaluation measurement is supposed to be independent from other. Well, there must be ground truth there, right? I think the ground truth yeah. here is that the noisy data would have higher influence. Yes, that's the point. So. <laughs> so this is the ground truth. And then the uh -huh. function would, would calculate the influence of each chaining data to itself. So that's the influence, right? It will have a higher <laughs> influence to itself, itself, right? Yeah, that's the ground truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and then the influence so, yeah, function yeah, or yeah. this method that will calculate yes, and influence. Yeah, yeah. I got a point. So and then, my next question is why the clean clean samples will not have high higher influence to itself. It will have high influence to itself, correct? But if you look at the absolute value between these two, then the noise which two which two the the, the, the influence of a clean sample or the influence. So it is self it is self influence, which means that it's going to test itself, test yeah. the training effect yeah. against it itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. the absolute influence of noisy data would be higher than the noise data. Sample. The the influence Why? of because mm -hmm. in order for noisy data to be classified as its noisy label, then it must have high influence to the model, right? Otherwise, it would be classified as its original label. So the the noisy label would have strong influence to make it to uh, anyway if we cl only classify. Right, because for the noisy data, it will so have it some will nearby to, clean sample. It will, will have a lot of need to struggle more. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, correct. In this correct. model, so yeah. there is point that noise data will have a higher influence. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the evaluation was supposed to be supposed if a, if a sample will have a higher influence on to the cells. It has higher probability to be a noisy data, and then the correct the label, and then to check uh, how how much the prediction accuracy okay can. so so if you, if if that is case so we just need to point that if we want to just pick up or pick up as a 
the samples with highest uh, influence. Because each mm -hmm. point would have a self influence value, and then you rank rank them by their score, right? And then you you find the top. I'm not, I'm not sure, top K1, and then manually check whether they are noisy data or not, and then fix them. They, no, they are noisy to be manually checked. So just- I think sure. in the paper, they, they mentioned about- the the Manual check. check. Oh, yeah. No need for manual check, because we're not original label right? this, right? Uh, but if you correct the them, mm. and you will find that the accuracy, the test accuracy increased. At least than the normal, uh, than the random scenario. Yeah, this is based on assumptions of the noise that is uh, minority. Oh, oh, mm. right. So, Jimian, do you have any comments on this one? So, which means that noise that have a higher influence or a larger influence <clears throat> to predict itself? I think I don't have question because every model is has high influence to itself, but for noisy data, their influence to itself is extremely large. I, I thought it's intuitive. Uh, okay, maybe you can follow this, <clears throat> this these points. And uh, what is um and what is uh, is there any tables for this one? Uh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They have three data sets. The first one is binary image classification, uh, ResNet. And second one is the sentiment analysis uh, by RSTM. And third one is the credit risk identification, basically just like true or false uh, classification with XG boost. So uh, the left table is uh, the mislabeled data identified with number of fraction training data checked. And this one is uh, after you crack data, you retrain it and that, and then we record the test accuracy. So basically they mentioned that RPS LG shows slightly better performance than both influence function and the L2 on all tests. And they also show a significant performance gap to the random baseline for all three tests as a debugging tool. Let's read this data. Mislabel, so uh, uh, I think they identify so the random is the worst, right? And it's yeah. margin, there's a small margin over inference function, yes. Uh, but I think influence and RGE are very similar based on my observation for the means uh, classified label. And by the way, real fan, did, how do we do the experiment? Kind of about how do we do the noise data detection? Would you would do this noise data detection for the label label recommendation, right? Mm. Mm. Well, by the way, trace testing to training, we did the do self inputs. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, right now that we don't do self inputs. But so if the intuition of the noise data is more impactful. We should do that. Also. We we do need to do the self inference function experiment. Mm. 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 Then we can have some more intuitive examples. For example, the binary class uh, image classification, and they said the influence fun function and RGE are quite similar. There are just some small difference in the order. And the original L2 norm function contains a lot of repetition. And that's a problem we mentioned already. Oh. I think the major problem of the old RPS is supposed to be the duplicated explanation. Yeah, L2 have the duplicate problem. Uh, and they also have the sentiment analysis. So uh, they are saying the their explanation is more coherent to the property of the test point. For example, they say all of their explanations start with uh, this. So they think that's what the model believes. Positive sentiment should start with this. Um, how do they how do they use the representation of symptoms for this explanation? Representation of the function. Yes, yes. So the, 
if we want to use in RPS, right, we must uh, to pick up the representation. And how do they select those representations for this NLP model? Uh, representation meaning they find those test uh, training samples with highest alpha. And, and now you're choosing the, the, the highest alpha. And how do they calculate its i? Because each word or how many individual value. Oh, I <laughs> they didn't mention, but I guess the by RSTM TM should be an old method. I don't know. Maybe they use yeah. one hot encoding. It is sentimental analysis, so which means that they might use the last layer before the second one, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, then the one last layer I see do the second one. Okay. Oh, and, and for the credit credit risk, uh, RPSL2 is removed because it, it requires fine tuning and is incompatible with in samples. So uh, they are saying that their method is better explaining, for example, here the checking account for all for test and the examples are all known and it's more similar over here. And lastly, uh, they have some assumptions. The first assumption is that it's a classification model and there is linear last layer before the activation function. And they say this may seem restrictive, but many widely adopted. Uh, classifiers uh, satisfy this requirement. And they must uh, assure that the given model is well trained near the settle point and the gradient of loss with respect to the parameter is close to zero. And all other methods also require the same assumption. And this often holds in practice. Many classifier models will be trained to near convergence before deployment. And the exception is when early stopping is used as a form of regularization. And lastly, yeah, I, I, sorry. So we must find some new questions for us. So in this case, I have our empirical interpretation to not have this restriction. Mm -hmm. So the uh, you get the second, you get the second point here. Mm -hmm. There is a risk. There is a risk of how on how effective the model is. You understand this point? Oh. Yeah, it, it, it is actually saying that uh, the effectiveness or theoretical guarantee mm -hmm. depends on the sale point, which means that the gradient is zero mm -hmm. um, here. But for the models with with for the models not for a sale point, and their effectiveness or their deduction may not be accurate. Mm. So I'm asking the question, the EIF, the empirical inference function, do not have this problem. Yeah, it does not suffer from this. Yeah, maybe that is a point you can use for the back okay. okay, let's move on. And uh, lastly, the impact. They mentioned the ensemble models are important and they propose a method to explain ensemble models. They also mention in the title, right? And uh, sample based explanation methods are very important to validating and improving, and they can help debugging. And one potential negative impact is uh, using of training data may raise privacy concern. Uh, but maybe some data anonymization may mitigate such issue. Yeah. So what are the concerns? I think we mentioned this in our paper. So sometimes the inference will be very focused or very dense, so which means that several images or several samples have already been enough to explain one testing samples. Mm -hmm. But for other cases, the uh, inference is very diverse and distributed, and even distributed for many, uh, in many samples. I think when we're talking about uh, this inference, maybe we also need to look into diversity. But did you not explain this uh, diversity issue, right? So the explanation, explanation diversity. Uh, you can think about you can think about inference is a kind of a, a bunch of money, right, or a bunch of or, or, or some waters, 
you just spread the water, spread the money to several training points. And sometimes a lot of training points may have the money, but sometimes a very limited number of the training points will have the money. And such a distribution actually matters for how to do the follow-up work for with inference option. Um, you get my point? But basically, I'm talking about the full up application of inference function. So, the inference function is basically a tool, a facility for us to do debugging, repair, etc. So, the first mm. All right, I think Jing uh, Lian did a very good job for explaining <coughs> this paper. And uh, yeah, maybe you can quickly wrap up and to see whether students have any question. Uh, no, no special wrap up. Um, my takeaway that is a good way for test result explanation, and we can use it as debugging too. Actually, I also made some slides, but never showed mm -hmm. that's the relationship between this method and the influence function. So they get the influence function and then do the first order derivative and they find out they, they have a very similar format with their original method. So they are just saying like for influence function, this first- So you read the papers of the influence function as well? Uh, no, this is in <laughs> this paper, but they mentioned influence uh, function. As long as we have uh, six <clears throat> using Tyler expansion, expansions, we always have the <clears throat> the, the, the hashing matrix, right? Yes. So, do they mention how do they calculate the hashing function? Uh, no. I saw one review also asked, but I didn't <clears throat> see the response. And also, um, have they provided performance evaluations on, on for their approach? A formula. Right, so this, I think the approach is almost very similar to this in corresponding paper five years ago. They calculate as a function, have a one step mutual. They take one unit steps to calculate the input function. Yeah. They, they have GitHub. You can look at the code. Okay. Okay, yeah, so I think I do not have further questions here. Is there any questions for this um, inference function? Okay, if not, maybe we can call it a day. Thanks everyone for attendance. See you next week.